This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we support design engineers and make lightning protection easy. You're listening to the Struck Podcast. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And here on Struck, we talk about everything aviation, aerospace engineering, and lightning protection. All right, welcome back to the Struck Aerospace Engineering Podcast. I am your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's show, we're going to talk about a couple F-35s recently struck by lightning over Japan. Uh, We'll talk about some Airbus production plans that have been exposed that maybe are showing a rift with some engine makers. Uh, We'll talk about Textron and how the Cessna name has been removed from a new Denali turboprop. In our engineering segment, we'll talk a little bit about shape memory alloy and the quest to reduce uh, noise from airplane landings. And then our EVTOL segment, we'll talk about Bell, some really interesting Volocopter news and Joby news as both companies have done test flights recently, which is exciting. So Alan Hall, our aerospace expert is here. Alan, how are you, sir? Good, Dan. Busy week. This is going to be a couple really interesting topics. So let's go. Yeah, so first, uh, these two F-35B stealth fighters were struck by lightning over Western Japan. Um, Alan, it seems like these these stealth uh, fighters, these jet fighters, I mean, do they have as robust of a lightning protection system as like a commercial airliner? Are they more at risk? Are they less at risk? And, and what was the deal with these uh, two F-35Bs? <laughs> Well, having both struck is interesting. Obviously, they tend to fly somewhat in formation, but you would think only one of them would get hit, but both of them got struck. I don't know if it was during the same lightning strike or the two independent events. There's really no definition of that yet, but it's inexpensive. It's a, was a class, we defined it as a class A mishap, which means it's more than roughly $2 million to fix. That's wow. a big deal. Yeah, that's a lot of cash uh, on a lightning repair. The F-35 has all the lightning protection features to keep it in the air and keep it doing its mission, but not much more than that. And the trouble with anything military on a fighter or even the, the latest drone kind of aircraft that are coming out, the, the, wing, the quote unquote wingman type aircraft, is that they have stealth features and that the stealth coatings are not lightning friendly. So even though the underlying structure, which is most likely carbon fiber, can handle a lightning strike, all the coatings on top of it that make the aircraft uh, radar invisible don't really conduct any energy. So the lightning tends to penetrate through it and explode some of that off. And it takes a good bit of time and engineering uh, know-how and technicians and coating awareness to reapply that coating, clear off what has been damaged and reapply the coating so the aircraft is as stealthy as when it was out of the factory. That's where your your costs really lie. Everything else on the aircraft uh, should be tolerant to at least most lightning strikes. At least the flight control systems will be for sure. But it does to get to the two million dollar point. It makes you wonder if they also had some electrical system issues that they're going to have to replace some components. So that's pretty expensive. You don't see these mishaps hap- happen with lightning very often. And yeah, and you, I think you're the one that first introduced me to the the lightning rods that the F-35s are putting out on the on the airport when they were stored out in the open. Mm-hmm. They had put these lightning rods uh, out in the yeah. open to keep the lightning from hitting the air, aircraft because a lightning strike to the aircraft is very expensive. So we can put up some copper pipes or whatever they were using to attract lightning and keep it away from the airplanes. Same thing. It's the same thing, right? They, they know that it's a lot less expensive to prevent lightning strikes, particularly on the ground, than it is to repair them. So there, it's it's an expensive ordeal. And usually the Air Force will put out some information many months from now uh, of, of what generally happened, not the specifics. And especially when they classify it to that high level, the safety people get involved. It, 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 it's interesting. I've never heard of two airplanes flying information getting struck sort of quasi simultaneously on the same flight <laughs> that that one's new well and the thing with the f-35 is it's i mean the air force was i don't i would say tongue lashed by the gao office saying that the <laughs> cost of the f-35 program is just out of control 
Yeah. Um, and so when you talk about the $2 million repair bill for these lightning strikes, that just is just like another strike against this program. I mean, it's just apparently, like you said, all the material, just everything about that plane is just out of control expensive. And that mm -hmm. it's just an unsustainable program long term for the Air Force. So cost wise, that seems <laughs> it seems in line with what the GAO has said. But then again, um, airplanes are expensive. I, I don't know. I mean, how, yeah, where do you fall true. on the expense of the F-35 program? Well, any aircraft program is expensive in the first several aircraft off the production line tend to eat more of that engineering <laughs> expenditure. It kind of gets rolled into those first couple. And the thought was as they got into more of a production mode that the, the cost would drop like it does on most aircraft programs. But on the F-35, it hasn't really dropped as much for a variety of reasons. I think because it's the latest and greatest, my impression is that it's like this wish list thing that happens for the aircraft i can it's so versatile that i can mod it and add to it and constantly upgrade it well that's just brand new costs onto the airframe you would think the airframe itself would be fairly stable my guess is that the electronics and electronic warfare things are being modded upgraded improved because the airplane is super capable but there's that never-ending feeling like we could do better and that just adds to the cost of a program. And you know, I, you know, the the GAO Air Force battle has been going on since the dawn of the Air Force. So I never worry about that too much. I'm more worried about is the Air Force prepared for the next battle, whatever that looks like, and do we have the correct uh, airframes and pilot training to deal with that threat? And the Air Force has always been making the contention that the F-35 is that next generation thing. And we haven't had a big conflict recently, but when we do, I think the Air Force will be justified and the GAO thing will go away. So some new reporting uh, about Airbus has, I don't know if there's a rift, but so basically Airbus has announced plans to essentially flood the market with, um, you know, heavy targets for a lot of new jets. And this is a cause for concern amongst engine makers because they're basically saying, hey, if you flood the market with this many new jets uh, between now and 2025, our repair business for current engines is really going to take a hit. Um, Alan, is that the way you see this uh, kind of going out as Airbus just says, hey, this is what we want to do? Uh, <laughs> I mean, do they, do they owe this to the engine manufacturers to stay within spec for them where they want to see their their older planes stay in service? Well, I think it has more to do with asking for cash from Airbus to expand facilities and to bring more people on. And so if you're, let's just pick Pratt and Whitney, just just because they're relatively local to me. So if, if Airbus wants to have more airplanes go down the production line, then Pratt and Whitney would need to produce more engines. That's awesome from Pratt and Whitney's mm -hmm. point of view. The problem is that if you ask for so many more engines that you have to build new facilities, that's not easy thing to go do because you, you wonder from Pratt and Whitney's standpoint, well, how long is it going to last? And if I build a hundred million dollar facility and bring on a bunch of people and Airbus decides to all of a sudden cut back, well, I got this piece of overhead that I can't get rid of. And so do I want to do that? <laughs> so but what they're saying is instead of building a new facility, we're just going to devote our workforce towards your new production lines, which means that our workforce will not be doing a lot of the maintenance things that come in. Mm -hmm. And that that's where the difficulty lies is that either, and this happens on most aircraft programs, uh, that the OEM airframe company ends up writing a check to defer some of the cost or to reduce the risk for an engine manufacturer, or they get a plan B put together and they'll bring somebody else on to fill up the, the, cap the repair capability that Pratt & Whitney will no longer be able to do. So there has to be some give and take, right? And Airbus, because Airbus is just going to, in, in a sense, and I think this is the way the engine manufacturers kind of think of it, uh, Airbus is, and Boeing would do the same thing, by the way. They are trying to make a bunch of money in a short amount of time, but I'm going to eat that, that I'm not going to participate in the upside. I will only participate mostly on the downside, and that's what scares everybody. So moving on, uh, it looks like Textron is, you know, removing the Cessna name from their new Denali turboprop. 
Um, Alan, is this an important issue or is this just sort of like a common rebranding? Denali, a Cessna airplane, it's a brand new airplane. It's not like it's the caravan of, of old that Cessna, the last sort of real larger scale um, propeller driven airplane that Cessna made. All the, the beach line has the heritage of with all the King Airs, everything sort of turboprop related and a lot of the Denali looks like a derivative of beach products. And so you have really two great names that fit certain slots. The beach name that basically essentially dumped all the jets that beach used to make and are focusing on the King Air line for the most part. And then the Cessna has always claimed to fame has been the Citation, which is the jets. So you have this turbo prop propeller airplane business and you've got a jet business why do you want to cross the <laughs> cross the streams like in Ghostbusters? You, you don't want to cross the streams here because your marketplace recognizes those differences and there is a community built around each of those. The Citation community is very strong and and they think they have the best product and the, the beach community thinks they have the best product and now that Textron's in the middle, you got these sort of two feuding brothers uh, in this under the same roof and then how do you deal with that and I, I I'll give you an example when we when I worked there at beach years ago it was owned by Raytheon and the airplane I was working on was the premier and they wanted to call it the Raytheon premier like the and it, that made zero sense why not call it the beach premier and eventually that did happen by the way but Raytheon felt like they wanted to label that the premier they're paying for the program so they want to put their name on it but our, our feeling in the company was, well, Raytheon also owned Amana Appliances in Iowa. And when I went to the appliance store, I was buying an Amana. I, I, I never bought a Raytheon dishwasher. <laughs> I bought an mm -hmm. Amana dishwasher, right? So if I, if I have that heritage built up in the name, then why am I getting rid of it? Because that's part of the appeal. As, weirdly, as weird as that seems, because it's just a label, it's still... There's a heritage built around it, uh, uh, built around with it. Let me give you an example. I'll give you an example in automotive because we had this discussion recently. Have you seen the new Mustangs? Yeah, from Ford. Mm -hmm. It's a hatchback. The new yeah, Mustang is a hatchback. They don't, they don't look like a Mustang. Right, and they relabeled the Maverick. I don't know if you were born when the Maverick ended, Dan. The Maverick was a kind of a no. little little car. They relabel taken the name off the Maverick, which in my world is like not, not the greatest car in the world, and put it on a truck, a pickup truck. So they're relabeling these, they're taking these very famous names, Mustang being definitely the premier one with the inside Ford, and sticking to a vehicle that doesn't remind you of anything you would think of as a Mustang car. And I, and that thing, I think that still translates on the airplanes today. Uh, if anybody came out with a, uh, you know, Learjet. I think Learjet still carries a swagger, even though they're not going to be making Learjets anymore. The Learjet name still carries swagger. People recognize it. It's like Jello, it's or Kleenex. It's just the brand name. It, it goes beyond the brand brand itself. It is what you call a whole swath of products is Learjet. And I, I don't know why you want to get rid of that. Dan, do you, are, do you see other things in, in the commercial market where they do that? I, I, I just haven't seen it, but in airplanes, they do it all the time. Yeah, I, I think you have to be really careful because I think brand identity and the weight of a really strong brand, like you said, has a significant impact on buyer behavior. So like you said, if Learjet is this famous thing, like if your your company used to own a Learjet or the famous CEO or had a Learjet or your dad owned a Learjet or you just heard about famous people that owned a Learjet, then maybe you want to own a Learjet, even if it's the exact same thing. It just now it's a, you know, it's a, a I can't, I can't uh, ad lib some random name off my head, but you know, a couch jet. I don't know. I have a couch uh, across the way. You know, it, like the brand, the brand does matter. Even if Apple put out the same exact products, but there's a different line that was like the pair. You'd be like, oh, I don't know about that. So. <laughs> Yeah, I pair. <laughs> there's definitely there's definitely tricky marketing stuff, and there's some mental importance about branding. I mean, you, you do see this. I remember there's a software app that I was using for a while that they wanted to rebrand, and everyone's like, I don't like that new name. They're like, we're not going to call it that. And I think they, like, months later, just, like, quietly 
shelved that idea to change their company's name and they haven't they're just still the original they're still the original company that i signed up for so yeah i, I think there's missteps there sometimes with brand i think brands have more weight than people think it's not a willy-nilly thing sometimes especially when it, like you said it's been around a long time where especially like learjet or um you know any of those were like had some real that was a real thing swagger like yeah All right, so in our engineering segment today, we're talking about wings and slats. So obviously when an airplane is coming down for its landing, um, you know, those slats lift up, they help, Alan, is it in, they increase, they decrease lift? Help me it out changed, here. I'm not an airspace, well, I'm not an airspace the, engineer. The, the forwards that on the leading edge of the wing, on the front edge of the wing, they have slat, what they call slats, and slats actually change the complete airfoil so they kind of deploy forward and down to make basically more curve in the wing think of it that way uh, so mm -hmm. it deflects more air and provides more lift at lower speeds so when you're flying slower you have uh, more sort of maneuverability lift at slower speeds and it, it's an efficiency thing because you don't want to carry that wing shape when you're trying to fly fast you want a very narrow thin efficient wing so a slat is a, a mechanism of providing uh, a uh, a wing fit for the different phases of flight so it just moves forward and down usually when you're landing got it that makes sense so um but one of the problems is that as that slat deploys there's some sort of negative space underneath mm -hmm. it that then the air what flows sort of around through like does that cause like some turbulence in the air what does that do because when it these does deploy it causes a lot of noise right right if you if you've flown on a 737 uh i'm pretty sure they have slats because yeah or and or airbus will have similar things where once you change the shape of the wing there's uh, you get some turbulence noise and just because of the way you have to mechanically move the slat uh it it, when the air flows over those mechanisms, it can create turbulence, and you, you tend to hear it. Same thing like when you put – I'll give you a, a similar uh, piece. When you drop the landing gear, you can hear the air flow over it. It's very turbulent, and you can hear the airplane shake and vibrate when the landing gear drops. That's why they tend to do it late, late in the flight, even though they could do it much sooner. It's just there's a lot of turbulence around irregular shapes like landing gear and, in this case, the actuators around slats. So this solution uh, that's being proposed is uh, some shape memory alloy. Alan, is this a brand new type of alloy or has this been around for a while? Shape memory metal has been around for probably since the 80s is when I first remember seeing them. Uh, so uh, it has a, 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 a set shape. Uh, you, so you can take, it usually has to do with heat, the way to convert it, but you can also do with electricity, I think. But you can... Uh, have a, a, a intrinsic shape that I'll always revert to. Uh, and if you deform it, uh, it'll move like normal metal, but when hit with a current or heat, it re 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 reforms back into its original shape. So there's been a lot of discussion about using memory metals to do a lot of functions. Like in this particular case, they're talking about using it in the little areas where the slats go to fill up the voids. Um, and then pulling it out of the way, so it could it could be like this expandable piece uh, that would reset every flight, and then you could basically solve a problem solve a problem with memory metals. The the issue with memory metals has been in aerospace, mostly in aerospace, is is it trustworthy? Because everything that mm. is involved with an airplane, all the alloys, aluminums, titaniums, steels have been vetted over the 100 plus years of airplane flight, or mostly since the 30s. Um, so we have a really good database on how those metals work. And when you put something new in the middle of that, particularly something that has to do with flight controls, that's scary. And so you don't have the database, you don't have the history of the, of the material performance to rely upon. And if it went wrong in the wrong spot, you could, in theory, in worst case, have a big accident. So designers are reluctant to incorporate really new technology in a, in a situation where it has big safety risk. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you, you talk so much about the hurdles of certification and uh, obviously of safety. 
and yeah. just like you said the longevity and like I, th- I think the trustworthiness is like you said is important because if you find out that one of these has like eh, sometimes it doesn't bounce back as well as it's supposed to right then it's like well can can we really install this material and i don't know the the burden of proof there is probably really high it is it's super high and then you have like, to have how do you maintenance- figure that out right and then and then you have to have if maintenance procedures and inspection procedures there's a whole lot of of engineering <laughs> and support that happens when any sort of new feature happens on an airplane it could be a new type of seat i mean they're just every little part of an airplane has instructions for it and a lot of times i just think it doesn't make a lot of sense to use a new material in a place where it could have uh, serious negative consequences if you're using it somewhere else uh in a galley or something and you know i think that makes a lot of sense but that's the thing is that everybody wants to make a big splash with their new materials in the most critical areas of an airplane and none of the designers want to do that all right so moving on to our evtol segment today first we're gonna start with bell so bell is unveiling a new high-speed evtol uh and this is going to be mostly for military applications and alan what's different about this i mean it says that they have a low downwash hover uh, capability jet like cruise speeds uh true runway independence uh, and they have hover endurance on top of that Mm -hmm. Um, they could scale and sort of like adapt the different you know different missions whether it's tactical or personnel recovery stuff like that um, and they could have gross weights of 4,000 over 100,000 pounds. Um, mm-hmm. So this sounds like a really significant program. Um, does this strike you as something that's near-term, long-term, um, and does it surprise you that Bell is in the ring for this? Bell has been developing a, a tilt rotor uh, for a long time, right? With the V-22, that mm-hmm. was the initial one that really was made and it's still in use today, right? So there has been success. And that that's not a small aircraft, by the way. If you ever stand next to a V-22, it's a sizable aircraft. They, they, they look big, yeah. They don't They're small. big. They're big. And the, the latest things that Bell has been uh, showing online is the, I think it's called the Valor, the V-280. I think that's what it is, which is another tilt rotor that has a V-tail on it that flies incredibly fast and is maneuverable. It's really cool aircraft. And now they're talking about sort of the, the next generation after that, which it had, the, the, the visuals on it are V-22-ish in terms of there's um, propellers on the wingtips, both wingtips. But there's some sort of propulsion jet in the middle of this thing. So the propellers actually fold back to make it more aerodynamic as it's in forward flight. And then it says it goes like 400 plus knots, which is essentially really close mm-hmm. to jet speed. So can you imagine taking off vertically and then propelling yourself at 400 plus knots forward? I mean, that, that from a military standpoint, you're like, that is the best thing ever because I want to get into a hot spot, land vertically, drop my people off or pick my people up and get the heck out of there. That's a perfect vehicle for that. I know right now it's still sketch related, but we ha- over the last 10 years, sort of under the radar, there has been some really fascinating changes, improvements, uh, milestones made in what I would term rotorcraft, anything with a rotating, you know, that would hover. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the the speeds are just gotten crazy fast. The technology has gotten so much better. The materials have gotten better, and the, the the software controlling these things, which which a lot of it is is software to flight controls to make it fly, has gotten so much better. So in in the meantime, it, it's it's just this weird dichotomy going on right now uh, on the vertical takeoff and landing. You have someone like Bell who is like really pushing the limit of what an aircraft can be called. And then you have these eVTOLs, which are on the bottom end of this thing. And the eVTOLs are getting all the money, but the the bells of the world are still out there really kicking butt right now. And I just I, I, every time I see another Bell video with the Valor up, I'm like, wow, that is so cool. So there, there's some really neat stuff in sort of the tilt rotor world. And that's not going away. I don't. I really don't think that's going away because of how capable those aircraft are. Yeah, they're, it's an impressive looking, um, looking design. And you know, like you said, even the tilt rotors of the past are impressive, impressive yes. aircraft. 
So moving on, uh, you know, and you've been calling for this for quite a while, which is that I want to see him fly, right? I want to see the EVTOLs fly. So <laughs> right. Joby has done this. They had a 154.6 mile uh, flight, which was awesome. Right. Uh, Volocopter also had a uh, crewed flight recently. So let's start with Volocopter. <laughs> what stuck out um, about that flight to you? I mean, they had really? a crew in it, which is awesome. Right. They have the huge, uh, unique design. They have like, it almost looks like antlers, like the way they um, <laughs> have the, uh, yeah. they're just interconnected. They're not all boxed in like a drone is. Like you see a lot of drones that have their, their um, propellers completely like, in clothes so they can bounce off stuff essentially that's not exactly a design of, of volocopters but um it's interesting it looks a lot like a helicopter compared to some others but uh, right what were your takes on the volocopter flight well volocopter came over to oshkosh which is the big uh, experimental aircraft association uh event and flew it <laughs> right in front of uh, everybody and with with people inside of it and that i think that's the set apart from every other sort of electric flight thing that's happening at the moment is volocopters crude they, in, in the sense they got, they got people on it and they're flying mm -hmm. around today it's real it's totally real now there's some there's obviously you know what volocopters mission is going to be is is very similar to a helicopter it's not going to travel large distances it can't but uh i i think in terms of being out front, there's a real interesting piece happening where Volocopter has been flying around for a number of years and they've had crew on it and it, it seems to be very capable. This, they're going to certify this thing. And and so they're demonstrating real technology, doing doing all the stuff that I've been talking about. And then there's the rest of the eVTOL world, which is totally uncrewed. There's nobody on it. And somewhere the market has to decide what it's going to do. Right? Are we headed towards a, a automated, non-piloted vehicle, or are we going to do something that we know? I think we're going to do something that we know. And Volocopter seems positioned to do it, but they don't seem to be getting the funding that some of these other EVTOLs are getting, which is fascinating. So it, it's still cool. It's still cool. If you can go on YouTube yeah. and watch the flight, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and we'll, we'll link to it in the description below. And then obviously the big one was Joby. So Joby, it seems like, you know, in this sort of like uh, horse race of EVTOL companies, they were like ahead. And now, you know, like everyone's sort of like jockeying for position. Um, but Joby flew 154.6 miles as a 77 minute flight as compared to Volcopter's four minute flight. And um, yeah, sure. it's a big distance. So what, mm -hmm. what stuck you out stuck out to you about this flight? Well, Joby had a a conference call uh, that was talking about their merger with the SPAC and coming out this new company. Essentially, it's what's going to be. It's going to be this new entity, financial entity, and I, it felt like they were doing this flight uh, to support the transition to being a publicly traded company. That's what it was wrapped around. So they needed to show that the aircraft would meet some of the milestones which they had set for it. One of them being sort of distance. How long could it fly and how much reserves were left to go do the task, right? And um, so they announced, the flight happened a couple of weeks ago, but they just recently announced the flight, which is sort of odd. So they had to do the flight in secret, which was a little disappointing because you, you, you would hope that you want to get eyeballs on that because it just builds confidence. But yeah. the thing, the th there's two things I noticed about that, Dan. They didn't have any crew in it. And putting the number of passengers in it, say four or five, uh, adds about, well, give me an average American <laughs> in terms of weight. 200 pounds, 250 pounds-ish, male. Uh, so there's another 1,000 pounds of weight on the airplane. And they didn't really talk about if they simulated passengers are in it or not. And then in that in that conference call they had talking about the, the, the merger and going public, they made a couple of really interesting points that seemed to get tossed to the wayside by the person that was inter interviewing them or discussing them. And it has to do with pilots and the sort of the Uber connection for Joby. They were pretty clear that they're only going to be Joby pilots flying these things, which means that the aircraft mm. 
won't be sold commercially to some rando person like me to go fly it. Yeah. I thought that was odd. And so th that seemed unusual because Cessna will sell an airplane to everybody that walks up. The second part of that is that it really forces them into a model of they're selling seats and miles on seats. I think the number I heard was, and everybody go check this, but I, th I thought it was four bucks per seat per mile. So you fly 100 miles, you're paying $400 for that seat. So if you have four seats at $1,600, of revenue that that flight would generate. So is the is the model the airplane, is the financial model the airplane and selling the airplane or is the financial model the ride service? Because it sounds like they are going for the ride service part, which pretty much every other aircraft manufacturer in the world has gotten away from. They, they, they used to do it back in the 90s, a lot of them did. And they they pulled away from that and so you feel this weird thing happen in the marketplace? Like Joby's saying, in a sense, everybody else is wrong. The market so far has been wrong. We see this potential market that nobody else sees, and we're going to capture it. But I don't know if that marketplace exists. There's a, there's a really weird feeling about it because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good press about it, and there's a lot of good feelings about it, and I think that's great mm -hmm. they're making this aircraft. It seems awesome, <laughs> you know, from an engineering standpoint. That is really cool, and I maybe someday I'll get a chance to, to take a Uberish ride in it. But financially, Dan, I'm not sure how this is all going to work because if the riders don't show up, does the airplane become the program become in peril by that? I, it's it's hard saying because the cost of the airplane is more than a jet. You can buy a jet for a lot less money than you can buy one of these eVTOLs. eVTOLs are going for about somewhere around four million dollars ish. And you can buy a jet for two that'll do the same thing, less. Um, so it, there, that that's the part yeah, that doesn't feel right. Off. Right, right. Yeah, which is may, course, maybe why Joe, they're Ubering. Didn't have passengers. Yeah, and they didn't have passengers or dummy weights on this flight. So right, what it tells you is hard to know because it's not really telling you that much about the noise profile because it'd make more noise if it needs more thrust, right? It, Maybe. Yeah, more weights, more um, is more noise. Yeah, it should be. Absolutely, it will be. And, yeah. But I, I think you're and right in the duration and distance. Yep, duration and distance will change because wait. And one of the interesting somebody asked the question of uh, the Joby rep at the time. You know, how does this translate? Well, like, if I had a fully cru crude yeah. version in full, what does that translate to? And the answer was, well, we're we're not really sure yet. Uh, and okay, I. I I get that's that. That's the only relevant ant question, yeah. That's the only yeah. question that matters. And there are standards for that. Like the, there are standards for what a flight profile looks like based on standard conditions with this much weight in it. You should know what that will lead to. Every airplane company knows that within the first several hours of flying the aircraft, you'll get a pretty good knowledge base. And that's what part of flight early flight test is, is to get those numbers and the performance versus temperature and altitude and all the stuff. But uh, they just that one was to me a fumble when it, it could have been a touchdown. And, and it, at least from the aerospace community, that I, that one wasn't it was handled. OK, you know, they didn't take a sack for 30 yards, but they didn't advance the ball at all. And that was seemed like a missed opportunity to me. Well, and from a marketing perspective and a persuasion perspective, it might make sense because now what's what's sticky in everyone's mind? Oh, Joby's can fly 150 miles. But if you're like, aha, mm -hmm. but wait, it didn't have any people on it. It didn't have, you know, it doesn't matter. Joby went 150 miles, right? Right. It's Whereas the what about. helicopter only was in the air for four minutes, even though they had right. crew. It's like 150 versus, you know, 77 minutes versus four minutes. It's like, well, again, there's an asterisk, but it doesn't matter because the first thing that people hear might be the thing that sticks in their mind, which is that they went really far in their test flight. Right, so and maybe there, it just sort of buys them that leash, you know. Well, it does, and I think Joby's playing in a different marketplace than the Textrons or Bells of the world. They are playing in a New York Stock Exchange kind of environment, an investment market, a venture capitalist market, which airplane companies don't tend to be too much in, in, in a publicly traded sense. Uh, so they have a different marketplace to advertise to. And if if you're right, Dan, if if you said we met our distance goals for this aircraft. 
reporters, most reporters that are outside the aerospace community would have no idea to even what questions to ask after that to make sure that was a true, you know, a 100 percent true and supported statement or what, what the comparison would be. And if you're talking about someone from uh, generic press that's dealing with, you know, SPACs, they're not going to ask. And that, I think that's where the, the problem comes in is because people – uh, at least, at least on the Joby side, and I see it on a couple of other EV tolls. It's not Joby specific. That, that there's more press spin than there is engineering yield yet, and that that and they, this, they got to get over that, right? This is sort of the Archer thing. It's, you know, there's, there's another example. Archer's in the same boat. They got to they got to put up the stuff because at some point you're going to have to fly the airplane and make money with it. And you're going to need all the pieces to be in place and having a fully crewed version going the distance at the speed you say under standard conditions is one of those check marks that really needs to be checked. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Struck Aerospace Engineering Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next week. Be sure to subscribe here on uh, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you listen. And we'll see you here next time on Struck. Strike Tape, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech's proprietary lightning protection for radomes, provides unmatched durability for years to come. If you need help with your radome lightning protection, reach out to us at weatherguardaero.com. That's weatherguardaero.com.